Chapter 9, slides 1 to 13. In this chapter, we're going to start looking at a different functional group, right? We were looking at alkyl halides for the last couple chapters, doing substitution chemistry and elimination chemistry. We're going to see those mechanisms come back again. However, we're going to be focusing on a new functional group, the alkene. So a little bit about the alkene before we get started. There's a general reaction that we're going to be seeing, although we're going to introduce a few more mechanisms to add to our repertoire of mechanisms. And what you're going to notice is that the alkene will react with some reagent. We'll call it AB. And what you're going to see is the double bond or the pi bond is going to disappear. And the reagent in some way is going to make up the bond at each one of those carbons. So carbon will end up as an octet, you know, satisfied with four bonds again, but the pi bond will not be there anymore. So we're going to be using that pi bond to do some chemistry. And overall, there's a couple things that you're going to see. You're going to see the two atoms that we're adding, or the atom that we're adding, either add on one side, sin, or on opposite sides, anti. We're also going to consider regioselectivity issues. Does A add on the left carbon or on the right carbon? Likewise, does B add to the left or the right carbon? So there's going to be a lot of considerations when we do these reactions for alkenes. Now, the pi, the pi bond that is going to, where all the chemistry is happening, that's going to do the chemistry, you have to remember is electron rich. The carbon, carbon pi bond, right, between these two carbons is a very rich in electron density area. You also want to remember that pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds, which is the reason why um, this weakness is the reason why we see reactivity for them. The electrons associated with it are fairly open and exposed. So I can draw this out if we think about what an alkene looks like from an orbital perspective. I can draw carbon, carbon single bond. If I represent the pi bond, if I represent the pi bond using the empty p orbitals, right, you can see that the, these p orbitals that overlap slightly, that cause the pi bond to be there, those orbitals are very open on both the top and the bottom face. You're going to notice that Right, the electron density is in two places. The electron density is between the two carbons in the, sing in the single sigma bond, and it exists in the p orbitals, right? So above and below, top and bottom of the molecule. Remember, those carbons are sp2 hybridized, right? The carbons of the alkene are both sp2 carbons and so they're trigonal planar. Planar being the op operative word here. Planar, which means that chemistry can happen on their top face or on their bottom face. The double bond electrons are, can therefore act, since it's an electron-rich area between the two carbons, with one of the bonds, the pi bond, right? One of these bonds is a sig sigma bond, and the other one is a pi bond. The pi bond, the one where the p orbitals are just mildly overlapping, as shown in the orbital diagram down below, that pi bond is what it, we're going to use to do the new chemistry. So what I think is kind of cool, and thinking about a general reaction for alkenes, is this right here. The alkene is going to serve as our nucleophile or our base, whichever one, depends on what the reagents are. So whenever you are trying to do alkene chemistry, here's the good news. You're always going to know where to start your, your arrow pushing. The mechanism will always start at the pi bond, and you're going to look to your reagents to react it with something. Maybe it's an acid, in which case the pi bond reacts with the H+, or maybe it's an electrophile, a carbon, or a, some other species, a boron, something. And that double bond breaks and forms a new bond with the electrophile. 
So that's the general trend for the electron pushing. Now, that's not the mechanism per se. That doesn't have a name. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these new mechanistic motifs for when we have a, an alkene as the starting functional group. Now, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the properties of an alkene. Alkenes are very similar to alkanes. I mean, think about it, right? There's not a lot of difference between the atoms of an alkane and the atoms of an alkene. If you had one, two, three, four, five, six, you have hexane. What's the difference really in properties between hexane and say something like hexene? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? I mean, okay, you've got two fewer hydrogens, but does that really change the polarity? Does it really change the intermolecular forces? I mean, there's no hydrogen bonding on these two systems. There's no strong dipole in any direction. So, you know, they're very similar. And I think that's just a good thing to consider. Alkenes are very similar to alkanes, if, if that's the only functional group you're looking at. Now, net dipoles. Okay, if you get down to it, there can be a difference in dipoles between certain types of alkenes. And if you look here, you've got the um, overall dipole moment of the cis double bond relative to the overall dipole moment of a trans double bond these cancel because they're equal and opposite in direction. And so therefore, the net if, if, if the groups on either side are equal, the trans nature of it makes the vector dipole opposite. The overall net dipole for a symmetrical trans double bond will be zero net zero. So there will be no overall dipole moment. While the cis, even if the two groups are symmetrical, because one um, portion of the double bond is different uh, and you have the hydrogens on the other side, there is a net overall dipole moment. But these aren't huge dipole moments. These, these are not going to uh, make large waves when it comes to changing the boiling point and the melting point and all those other properties we can really measure. How about the acidity of a double bond versus an alkane? Well, we saw that, again, ARIO, if I were to deprotonate, one, two, three, four, five, six, let's take hexane, and I added a base, and I took off one of the hydrogens on hexane. I had, it doesn't really matter which one. I'll take one of them off here. That negative charge left behind, oof not very stable, right? Ario tells me, first look at the atom. You've got a carbon. Well, let's do the same for a hexene molecule, but let's remove one of the hydrogens, say, off of the end. Six. Okay. Comparing these two, an alkane minus versus an alkene minus, you, you first start with the atoms, carbon versus carbon. All right, well, that's a draw. Resonance. Uh, the alkane does not have any double bonds in it, so that negative charge is isolated. And in the alkene version, the negative charge is on the vinyl position, so that's not very good. How about induction? Mm. Not a huge contributor. In either case, we've got donating groups off of the carbon bearing the negative charge, so that's not a good, that's not a helpful thing. We want withdrawing groups, but there are no withdrawing groups, right? There's no electron withdrawing group nearby. So the last thing you get down to is the orbital. Putting that lone pair into, in, in the first case, an sp3 orbital versus an sp2 orbital it's a lot better to put it, that, that extra lone pair into the sp2 orbital. Why? The sp2 orbital has 33% s character, lower in energy, while the sp3 orbital has 25% s character, higher in energy. We went over this when we, when we did ARIO. So at the end of the day, does it make a huge difference? 
makes a difference, but look at the difference. The alkane S, uh, pKa is around 50. That's not very acidic. Remember what the pKa of water is. The pKa of water is around 15.7. So anything higher than that is not moving in the acidic direction. The pKa of an alkene is more acidic than an alkane, but not by a lot. It's still pretty darn high, so it's not a very good acid either. So alkenes and alkanes have very similar properties. Okay, how do we know how to make alkenes? Ooh, well, this is a review, ladies and gentlemen. Right? We just studied elimination reactions. I know two ways to generate an alkene. I could do an E2, say with a bulky base that's strong and a tertiary halide, I am definitely going to see some eliminations occur of the E2 variety in an anticoplanar manner to give me, look at that, an alkene. I know how to make an alkene. It's called elimination. I could have chosen to do E1. maybe with t-butanol and some heat. Now, arguably, this could give me some SN1 products too, but ultimately, I will form the elimination product. I also probably need a little bit of acid in there. If I was using a, an alcohol, I would need some acid. This is a reversible reaction. First, I would protonate the OH, and I could have used a bromine, either way is fine. I would have protonated the OH, made a better leaving group, acid-base chemistry. First step was acid-base chemistry. Next step, leaving group leaves, right? Because this is my whole E1 or E1 process right here. The result of that is a tertiary carbocation. I stop, I look around, Tertiary is the best I can do here, so I'm good. I'm, but I've checked. Good for me. Just got to make sure I do that, you know. And then I take, I have the carbon with the carbocation. I have to involve a carbon next door. And the t-butanol, which is both the base and the solvent, is going to take off one of the hydrogens, giving me, in this case, the same product as I did for the E2. So ultimately, and that doesn't always happen, we don't always get to the same major product, but given the examples I've given you here, this was just simply a review. I just wanted to show you that you already know how to make alkenes. You simply do elimination reactions, E1 or E2. Okay, so we know a little bit about their properties. Not too terribly different than alkanes, but what makes them really different from alkanes is that they're reactive. I think that is the take home message is that when you look at their properties, alkanes have that pi bond, which is weak and can serve as a nucleophile. And that's what makes them interesting. That's what makes them function. That's why alkanes, we briefly went through in chapter six, we, what, we combust alkanes and we do radical chemistry on them, but it's really hard to control. Okay, enter alkenes. We've got a whole chapter dedicated to them. And as you'll see, they're very useful. We now know how to access alkenes. We can do e E2 and E1. And then what can we do with an alkene? Well, it turns out it opens the door to a lot of chemistry. And as I mentioned, electronically, from a mechanism standpoint, when you're faced with drawing the mechanisms, these new mechanisms you're going to learn, the wonderful thing about alkene chemistry is that you always know where to start your pen. 
start it at the pi bond. It's going to be your nucleophile or your base. It depends on what you're attacking. The pi bond is your nucleophile or base, and it's a carbon. Think about that for a bit. I'll come back to that point later. And we're going to be showing you different reactions, and the only difference is the electrophile slash acid that we introduce. Okay? But you guys now know the first step of the mechanism is going to look just like what I drew down below here. Now let's go back to our mechanistic motif worksheet. We've covered a lot of reaction mechanisms now. Right? We've got acid-base chemistry. We've been doing that since chapter 3. We did some radical chemistry when we did alkanes. We have now completed SN1, SN2, E1, E2. So where are we going next? Well, we're going to be covering this one right here. You can see it's a double bond that's attacking. Ooh, it's an, look at, it falls under the acid base category because we're gonna use the pi bond as a base sometimes. We're also going to be doing this whole section right here, the sin section. Sin meaning the same side of something, on the same face. Okay, and so we're going to see a sin 3. This is a term that we use at RIT. We're going to call it a sin 3 mechanism and a sin 4. Now, I want you to understand that the book does not call any of these reactions that I'm going to discuss with you sin 3, sin 4. They're not even going to talk about pi base. I'm going to use these terms. And this is me trying to get you, just like the SN1, SN2, E1, E2 chapter, you guys could look at the mechanism or at the reaction and decide what mechanism to employ. I think the books in organic chemistry do a marvelous job with these four concept mechanisms. Things start falling apart, in my opinion, in the, in the textbook. Not from a standpoint of it's not accurate. It is, everything they say is accurate. The problem is, is that they're stopping the categorization. And for me, I always like to find trends. That's what our brains tend to want to do, right? We want to find like a trend, something that I can start categorizing things in so that I can draw on it. I don't want to memorize 500 different things. I want to see a trend so I can hypothesize or predict things. So I give you, in alkene chemistry, three new trends that I'm going to point out to you every time we do it. If I happen to show you something else, maybe there might be a trend combo where we do SIN3 followed by an SN2, I'm going to tell you that. I'm not going to make it look like a new instance. So pay attention to the things that I categorize and tag or define. We're going to start with the pi base. Okay, so these are the three ones, these are the three new mechanistic motifs that we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to focus first in this section of the notes on the pi base scenario. Okay, this is a fun one. All right, and like I said, I call it pi base. You're not going to see this term in the book. Here's how I want you to set up your flashcard. On the front of the flashcard, I want you to draw an asymmetric alkene. Notice that on one carbon, there are two methyls, but on the other carbon, it's two hydrogens. This is going to help solidify some things for us. I also want you to write a very general acid solvent. Oh, you know, it doesn't have, they can both be above the arrow, below the arrow, I don't care. But over the arrow, somewhere around the arrow, is the alkene going to interact with an acid and a solvent. And on the back, you're going to write pi base plus an SN1. This is the motif formula that you're going to see. And this, the beautiful thing about it is that you're going to be able to be given many, many different types of reagents. And as long as you recognize it as an acid-solvent combo, you, can, you know exactly what to do. Let's begin the mechanism. I'm going to show you the mechanism using the same system. And this is the mechanism with arrows that I want you to learn to draw. All right. 
let's say I gave you, let me see here. Let's say I gave you HCl. And I gave it to you neat. I'm only giving you HCl, no solvent. Or the solvent I'm giving you is inert. It's not doing anything. So therefore, if, it, if the solvent really is not reacting, if it's aprotic, like acetone or something I gave you in the SN2 scenario, notice that I'm not, I'm not giving it to you. I'm not showing you what it is. Okay, so let's begin. I already know that I should start my pen on the pi bond. This is my nucleophile. I should say base because I'm giving you an acid. So this pi system is going to react with the partially positive hydrogen. Oh, look, I have a good leaving group. Ha! Huh. It's almost like an SN2, isn't it? But really, it's acid-base chemistry. It's pi base. The pi bond is acting like a base. If you want to call it acid-base chemistry, that's fine, too. It's a new type of base. We've never seen an alkene be a base before. So this is why I'm introducing it here. It's not a hugely crazy concept. Here's where it gets interesting. I, I want to show you that you can open up the pi bond in one of two directions. Let's call this carbon one and carbon two of the alkene. This is a regioselectivity issue. I could have made the bond with the hydrogen at carbon two. That would leave a carbocation at carbon one. Now, I want you to understand, see my red arrows that I drew? Those red arrows do not indicate direction of the hydrogen bond. Okay, they're just showing that the pi bond makes a bond with the hydrogen and the chlorine leaves with its electrons. It doesn't tell me where the carbocation is forming. You have to draw the intermediate to show your intention. The other option would have been if the hydrogen had gone at carbon one and the carbocation at carbon two. You guys can solve this. Which one do you think is going to form more readily? For example, which carbocation do you think is more stable? Have a think about it. We've already done this, right? We've been doing this since SN1. What I want you to recognize is that after this first step, once you form the major carbocation, now the only difference here is that I had a choice. When I was doing SN1, it was very easy to understand where the carbocation was going to form, right? The carbocation was going to form wherever the leaving group was. And then I had to consider rearrangements. Here, I have a choice. Because the nucleophile is opening up and, and opening up on one side versus another, we're going to form the carbocation, the emptiness. We have a choice, forming it, the empty orbital on one or forming it on two. If you told me that the tertiary carbocation was better than the primary carbocation, you would be correct. So I'm really not going to consider this one at all. The tertiary carbocation is going to um, be formed readily, very quickly, because it's the lower energy one. Now, what do I do with it? Well, I looked to the solvent. I wasn't given a solvent. So the only thing floating around is what? Chlorine minus. Right now, all I have to do is finish this out as if I was in an SN1 scenario. Chlorine minus is a terrible base, and given the reaction conditions, what's going to happen is you're going to get front and backside attack. It's the end of an SN1, where I'm at the part of carbocation rearrangement, I'm tertiary, I'm fine, I want to keep going. So the nucleophile attacks. I'm at the back end of an SN1. So ultimately I can draw front chlorine and back chlorine, but then I can step back and look and tell myself, ah, this is not a stereocenter, right? It's a carbon with three methyls off of it. So really, I don't have to draw both of them. I just have to draw the one major product. 
Now you're going to say, wait a minute. Didn't you tell me that SN1 is not, how am I getting just the SN1 product here? Why, why am I just getting SN1? That's weird. You told me that SN1 and E1 go hand in hand. You're right. But guess what? We're controlling this equilibrium. You know why? What happens if you do the E1? Do you not just get the starting material back? E1 leads to a, an elimination. So yes, the acid-base reaction getting to the carbocation is in equilibrium. And yes, the E1 product just brings you back to the starting material. So it's just going to look like you either have starting material or some product. And you're probably not going to get this going to completion, but you can, to get to someplace else, favor this major product. Just understand that doing the E1 just gets you back to your starting material. So over time, we can favor the final product. All right, now let's do something a little different. I'm going to do an example with HCl. No, you know what? I'll do HBr. It's, a, it's still an acid. And I'm going to do um, water. What I want to show you here is that as long as you recognize a protic solvent with an acid, you're like, all right, I know what to do. I'm just gonna do an acid-base pi base reaction, and then I'm just gonna finish it up like an SN1. No big deal. Pi bond acts as the base, grabs the electrophilic hydrogen, the electropositive hydrogen. Oh look, good leaving group. I just have to figure out if carbon one or carbon two would be better suited to hold the carbocation. Just like above, I'd rather form the new hydrogen bond on the right-hand side on carbon two, leaving the carbocation in the tertiary position at carbon one. Once I've decided that, I don't have to draw that hydrogen bond because those are assumed, that carbocation then falls into the SN1, the back end of the SN1. And the solvent is given this time, it's given as water. Can E1 happen? Sure. E1's just gonna take me right back to the starting material though. So it's just gonna look like more starting material didn't react. Getting me to the SN1 product, however, requires that the water attacks the carbocation from both the front and the back face. And just like before, I'm going to see one major product and I have to work this one up a little bit because I have an extra proton here so I'm going to work it up under a little bit of base which makes sense because if I want to neutralize everything I need to neutralize that HBr that's floating around. The base is going to do acid base workup taking that extra proton off and giving me the final product. Now what I want to show you is that the process was exactly the same. Exactly the same. But the products are different. So please, don't try to memorize products. Try to understand when to employ the right mechanism to calculate your final major product. These reactions as um, mapped on an en energy coordinate diagram are at, like so. You start with your alkene, your double bond starting material, and then the slow step, the rate determining step, is again, just like SN1, acid-base reaction trying to form a carbocation. Why? Well, because carbocations are high energy intermediates, just like they were in SN1. And then once you form it, that carbon does not have an octet, right? The carbocation has no octet, so man, it is high energy, very reactive. Please, just give me something to bond with. In this case, it's showing you the HBr scenario. Um, I'm showing you that the Br is going to quickly help that octetless uh, carbon out, giving us the product. Lower energy to get to the product. Okay. Now, let's see what this looks like if I were to consider using my hands as a model for this mechanism.
All right, so I showed you how to figure out the regio selectivity. I want to go back to this. There's a term that is talked about in every organic book. It's called the Markovnikov rule. It states that the alkene electrons attack the electrophile so that the more stable carbocation is formed. Okay, this is a very fancy term for something that we have been doing for a while now. You guys have been studying carbocations and what makes them stable and how to do rearrangements in order to get them more stable if you're able to do so, right? You guys have done hydride shifts and rearrangements with alkyl groups. This is not a new thing. The thought of making the, the better carbocation, the more stable one, it makes sense to us. So seeing one product and not the other indicates, like we said up above here, regio selectivity. So this is really Markovnikov rule is helping us understand regio selectivity. Because there are two carbons in an alkene, I have to figure out which one's going to get the carbocation and which one's going to get the, the H plus. That's a regio selectivity issue. And Markovnikov's rule is this blanket rule. Don't memorize it. You guys already have the tools that make sense. You can rationalize why one carbocation would be better than the other. In the case that I just drew, tertiary is better than primary, therefore inductive effects, right? Don't The electron donating nature of more methyl groups is going to help stabilize that empty P orbital. So we can understand why Markovnikov saw what he saw when he was in the lab. Why was he always getting that chlorine on the tertiary carbon? We understand the mechanism now, so we can predict these things. Here's the, th here's the deal, okay? You've got acids like HCl, HBr, HI, H2SO4. I mean, those are acids you're, you should recognize those as acids. I'm not going to give you something you've never seen before, something crazy. And solvents. What solvents can I give you? Well, dichloromethane is not a protic solvent. It's polar aprotic, like, like acetone. It's apolar. It's polar enough to get things into solution, but it's aprotic, so it's not an, it's, it can't serve as an acid. It's also not very nucleophilic. So things that you are used to seeing are alcohols and water. These are reactive. We've seen these be reactive solvents. Think about SN1. We're doing, the back end of this mechanism is an SN1. We close out the whole, the whole thing by employing our SN1 method. So take a look at these um, examples given. Notice that in each example, the alkene is completely different, right? It's a completely different starting material. Notice that I can mix and match these acids and solvents all day long. And if you were to try to make a flashcard for each of them with, with some you know, set problem as an answer on the back, you're just wasting your time memorizing products. Instead, try to learn to recognize the pattern, an acid and a solvent, an acid and a solvent. I know what to do. I'm gonna treat it like a base acid reaction using the pi bond as my base, and then I'm gonna finish it out like an SN1 because I got a carbocation. I know what to do with carbocations. SN1 tells me so. So let's let's just do two of these to show you how similar in process, but how different in outcome any one of these can be. Let's do, I don't know, let's do, let's do C together since we haven't seen HI. First step, I, don't, I always know where to begin. Start your, your mechanism using the pi bond electrons as a base to grab the acid given, the bond breaks, the iodine is a good leaving group. Notice that I'm only using the pi bond, so the sigma framework stays exactly the same. Where do I put the hydrogen? So one carbon gets the hydrogen, and one carbon gets the carbocation. The iodine has left. I want the carbocation on the tertiary position. The hydrogen then went to the other position. 
I'm happy with that. And I've put the carbocation in the best scenario that I could give it. There's no other carbocation rearrangement I would choose. So let's continue. Solvent. Ooh, I wasn't given one. Possibly an, an unreactive inert solvent is chosen. So the iodine is the best thing I've got. So let's finish this out. I'm going to get front and backside attack. Front and backside attack. Then I step back and I look at these two molecules and I ask myself what the um, relationship between them is. Well, the carbon where the iodine went is not a stereocenter because it has two of the same groups, the ring itself going around either side. So actually, I really only have one major product. These are the same. So there's one major product for this HI reaction with an alkene. All right, let's do, I don't know, let's try E. E looks interesting. Okay, I start with the alkene. I look, look, HBr, that's an acid. And I have a protic solvent. All right, I can do this. Pi bond reacts with the acid, kicks the bromine out. Now we have, let's, let's number. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Numbering your atoms is super helpful because I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Now that pi bond between two and three breaks. So two is going to get something and three is going to get something. That pi bond is going to react with the hydrogen. Where do I want my carbocation? Well, if I put it at two, it's tertiary. And if I put it at three, it's secondary. So I think I want to put the carbocation right at two. That means the hydrogen went at three. Okay. I don't have to draw the hydrogen in because hydrogens are assumed. Um, I check my carbocation. Tertiary is about as good as I can get. There's no resonance. There's no other hydride shift or alkyl shift I could do that makes it better. So let's finish her up. I did my acid base chemistry and now I need to just look at the solvent. Oh, look, it's ethanol. Ethanol is going to attack from the front and the back in an SN1 type scenario. Now understand that carbon two is not a stereocenter because it has two methyls off of it. So therefore, I have the ethanol attacking and I don't have to, I can show both the wedge and the hash, but I don't need to because I, if I know preemptively that that carbon is not a stereocenter, it doesn't matter. Front or back is gonna lead to the same thing. But I'm not happy yet. I mean, I still have that oxygen with a plus charge on it because I used the electrons from the oxygen. I didn't break any other bonds. I just used one of the lone pairs to make that bond. So I've got to work it up. Um, I'm under strongly acidic conditions anyway, so I'm going to work it up under basic conditions just so that I can take off any extra protons. My final product and my one and only major product is going to be this ether. One, two, three, four, five, six. Count your carbons, make sure that you have enough and that you didn't drop any in the process. So this is my final major product for E. Now here's the kicker, okay? Every single one of these has a name. I want you to go see if you can find them in the book. If you add an H and a BR across the double bond, it's called a specific name. It has a name. The book will call uh, using an acid in water a different name. Okay, and then if you add um, an acid and an alcohol across the double bond, you're also going to have a different name. So this is where I have a problem with textbooks. They start naming reactions as if they're like unique experiences and they're not unique experiences. It's the same mechanism over and over again. And what's the trend? You have an acid and you have a solvent or lack thereof. 
But you know what doesn't change? This doesn't change. You guys have the power to recognize the reagent relationship, see that there's an alkene, and then you'll know exactly how to calculate your answer. You don't have to worry about knowing what your answer is possibly going to look like. Don't worry about it. Just do what's prescribed. I've got lots of practice for you, and I can start making things more and more complex as time goes on. So I'm going to leave these for you guys to try on your own so that you can get really nimble, right? Flex that muscle memory on how to do pi nucleophile base reactions followed by or rounding it out with an SN1. Here's some more practice, which alkene when reacted with HBr is more highly regioselective. And then some more practice. I like the bottom ones too. They're showing you the product and they're asking you to think about what alkene would better make that. We then have more examples where you can, um, again, propose an alkene and a set of materials to make these reagents. Notice that you have in your power to make alkyl halides now. Oh, right? We know what to do with alkyl halides. We can do substitution chemistry with them. Alkyl halides can come from double bonds. Interesting. We're, we're going backwards and forwards. We know how to like interchange now between these functional groups. Depending upon the solvent, we also have an entry into making ethers, just like we did in SN1. So all of these, and I end with a real kicker of a, of a practice problem to consider. Um, all of these are great examples. And what you'll notice is that the reagents, albeit in different uh, combinations, shouldn't shouldn't trip you up you can do it you can just apply the pi base plus sn1 regime